Hey there, Professor Marshall here, taking you back to school. Ever wondered how schools back in the groovy 70s compare to the ones we've got today? Let's dive in and see how far we've come since the days of disco and bell bottoms. Smoking area for students. Believe it or not, there was a time when high schoolers could light up on school grounds without a second thought. Back in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, smoking was allowed in almost all public spaces, including schools. Can you imagine? Imagine that smokers had the freedom to puff away at their workplaces, in hospitals, school buildings, bars, restaurants, and even on buses, trains, and planes. It was like the whole world was one big smoking lounge. But when it came to schools, there was usually a designated smoking area for students who indulged. It might have been a corner of the schoolyard or a secluded spot behind the bleachers. Either way, it was a place where students could gather to smoke without fear of reprisal. But now, smoking on school grounds is is a big no-no. In fact, many schools have strict policies against smoking anywhere on campus, let alone in designated areas. And you know what? I think it's for the best. We now know just how harmful smoking can be, not just to the smoker, but also to the people around them. And when it comes to schools where the health and well-being of students should be a top priority, allowing smoking on campus just doesn't make sense. Lectures then versus today. Well, back in the 1970s, lectures were a whole different beast compared to today. Back then, we didn't have all these fancy gadgets and gizmos like you kids do now. No, sir, we relied on good old-fashioned chalkboards and overhead projectors. When a teacher walked into the classroom, there wasn't any PowerPoint presentation waiting for them on a smart board. They'd come in armed with a piece of chalk and maybe a few transparencies if they were feeling particularly tech savvy. And let me tell you, those transparencies were a marvel of modern technology back then. The pace of the lectures was a bit slower, too. We didn't have the internet to instantly look up information on Google to fact-check the teacher, and if we wanted to know something, we had to raise our hand and ask, or wait until we could hit the library after class. But you know, there was a certain charm to those old-school lectures. There was something about the sound of chalk scratching against the blackboard and the hum of the overhead projector warming up that just made it feel like you were really learning something. And hey, if you were lucky, sometimes the teacher would even bring in a film strip or a cassette tape to spice things up a bit. Computers then versus computers now. Back in the 70s, computers were as scarce as hen's teeth, especially in schools. I remember vividly how we had to reserve computer times like we were booking seats on a spaceship. And let me tell you, getting a slot was like striking gold. Those computers weren't the sleek, user-friendly machines we have today. Oh no, they were these massive mainframes housed in what felt like cold storage facility. I kid you not, walking into that building was like entering a sacred temple. We had to be mindful of our shoes, keeping the dirt away like it was holy ground. And we drop our voices to a whisper as if we were in the presence of some ancient deity. But despite the solemn atmosphere, there was a sense of privilege in being able to use those computers. We'd work like saints during our stimulated hours, making the most of every precious minute. And if we needed a printout, well, that was a whole other mission. We'd have to trudge over to where the dinosaur-looking dot matrix printers lived. And those things were slow as molasses. Yet, despite all the limitations and inconveniences, we considered ourselves part of the privileged class and the chosen few who had access to the cutting-edge technology of the time. Now, computers in school are a dime a dozen. Heck, they're practically everywhere you look. Kids these days have access to laptops, tablets, and all sorts of fancy gadgets that we could only dream of back in the 1970s. And don't even get me started on the internet. It's like a vast ocean of knowledge just waiting to be explored. But you know what? Sometimes I can't feel, but feel a pang of longing for those days when computers were rare and magical, and when using one felt like you were part of an elite club. There's another advantage of computers being so common now, the ability to like this video just like that. I'll give you time to do that. Done? Good. You earned yourself a gold star just for that. Now back to the video. Encyclopedia versus Google. When it came to gathering information, we didn't have the luxury of just typing a few words into a search engine and getting instant results. Nah, we had to put in some serious legwork. Take one history project I had in sixth grade, for example. 
When I was assigned to research Abraham Lincoln, I had to hit the library. And I mean literally hit the library because that's where all the information was stored. I started with encyclopedias, real hefty ones of knowledge that lined the shelves. Flipping through these pages was like going on a treasure hunt. But it didn't stop there. We couldn't just rely on encyclopedias alone. No, sir, we had to cross-reference with nonfiction books and even newspaper articles sometimes. Now, getting your hands on a newspaper article wasn't as simple as clicking a link. Oh, no, it involved a trip to the library's microfilm room. Rows of filing cabinets cabinets filled with these clear plastic slides of film, each containing a snapshot of a newspaper page. We'd have to reserve time in the library, then load up the microfilm into a projector and start cranking that handle rolling through the film at a snail's pace. And let me tell you, there was no search key or fancy algorithms to help us out. It was just us, our eyes, and hours of rolling through film hoping to stumble upon the right article for our projects. Researching for school projects today couldn't be more different. With the advent of the internet and search engines like Google, gathering information has become a breeze. I mean, you just type in a few words, hit enter, and voila! You've got millions, if not billions, of articles, websites, and videos at your fingertips. No more trudging to the library, no more flipping through dusty old encyclopedias, or wrestling with microfilm. It's all right there on your screen, ready to be explored with just a few clicks. And don't even get me started on the sheer volume of information available online. It's like having the world's biggest library at your beck and call 24-7. But, as convenient as it is, I can't help but feel like something's been lost along the way. There was a certain charm to the old-fashioned way of researching. A sense of adventure and discovery that's hard to replicate in the digital age. With Google, it's all too easy. Sure, you can find information in seconds, but where's the thrill of the chase? Where's the sense of accomplishment that comes from digging deep and uncovering hidden gems? Corporal punishment versus detention. Now let's talk about discipline in schools, an area that's seen quite the evolution over the years. Back in the 70s, corporal punishment was still very much a thing. If you misbehaved, you weren't just getting a slap on the wrist, you were getting a full-on whack. If you acted up in class, it was almost expected that you'd end up on the receiving end of some sort of physical retribution. It could be a paddle to the backside or a ruler across the knuckles. Sometimes a teacher would hurl an eraser your way for being too noisy. And let me tell you, it wasn't pretty. But thankfully, times have changed. Corporal punishment was rightfully banned in many places, including in 1977. And you know what replaced it? Detention. Yeah, nowadays, if you step out of line, you're not getting a paddling, you're getting extra time at school. Now, don't get me wrong, detention isn't exactly a walk in the park, it's still a form of punishment, albeit a less physical one. You're stuck sitting in a room for a set amount of time, usually after school, reflecting on your misdeeds. And let me tell you, it's not fun, so I'm glad we've moved past the days of corporal punishment. I can't say I miss it. Give me a detention any day over a whack with a paddle. Dress code for girls. Dress code for girls used to be, well, let's say quite traditional, and some might argue a bit restrictive. Schools often enforced rules that dictated the length of skirts and dresses, the width of shoulder straps, and the overall modesty of attire. Mini skirts were a hot topic, and girls were often subjected to scrutiny and even disciplinary actions if their clothing was deemed too short or too revealing. The emphasis was on maintaining a certain level of decorum and conformity. Now you'll find a much more inclusive landscape when it comes to dress code for girls. While some schools may still have guidelines in place, there's generally a greater emphasis on allowing students to express their individuality. There's a recognition that enforcing strict dress codes can sometimes perpetuate gender stereotypes and body shaming. Many schools are moving towards more inclusive and less gender-specific dress codes, allowing students greater freedom in their clothing choices. The focus has shifted towards ensuring a safe and inclusive environment rather than policing the length of a skirt or the width of a strap. Yet the topic of dress codes remains a point of discussion and at times controversy. Some argue that dress codes are necessary to maintain a professional and focused atmosphere in schools, while others advocate for even more flexibility to allow students to explore their personal styles without fear of judgment or punishment. 
Class dismissed. But before you go, homework. Would you rather attend a school in the 1970s or a school in the modern world? Share your answer with the class in the comments below. And if you like the video, please do consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.